Now, I'm, I'm just going to first establish who you are and how you got here. I mean, especially if you're 20, it's really interesting how people end up in the jobs they have. So you are from Hilversum, more or less. Yeah, Amsterdam born, I would like to add. And yeah, but stress. Yes, and okay. Insist. Okay. But I Absolutely. grew up around here. Yeah. I went to the school that you can see from the window, the Multatuli School. Okay. So a local local boy. Local boy. Made good. Yeah. And and then you um interestingly enough, you you did you went to high school here and then you went to study in Kansas. What did you do in Kansas? What happened there? Well, you may have noticed that this is a small country. And uh, we never went abroad on holiday. So I wasn't quite aware of just how small the country was. And so I had applied for a scholarship. I got a scholarship and I had to choose uh, a university. So I thought if I choose a university in the, in the middle of the country, it's a bit like Utrecht. You know, it's very easy to reach. <laughs> so you thought you're centrally located? Centrally located Kansas. And uh, okay. they call it flyover Kansas. Because, because there's nothing Anywhere yeah, in it's, the, in the it's 27 hours by bus, I think, from one coast to coast, or 36. Yeah, so I, uh, but it was e extremely interesting. So there's this pocket, and I, I uh, just before I arrived, uh, the Iraqis invaded Kuwait, and so I lived through the whole build-up to the Iraq War, and then the Iraq War, and so I, I think I've, I've always, I've come away with a com really fundamentally different idea of America from everyone else who went to study in either the West Coast or the East Coast, because I think you know, uh, elections are decided in the in the Midwest. Yeah. And so my understanding of America as a this sort of well-meaning, utterly backward place is very different from what most Europeans come back from uh, with. Uh yeah, because at, funnily enough, I studied there around the same time in Boston, completely different, of course. So what, what was so different in Kansas? What, I mean, what struck you about the people you met there? What was well, different? Well, they, they were more backward than the Egyptians that I went to interview six years later. They were Americans, at least then, but I think, given their electoral behavior, that's probably still the case, are so ignorant. I mean, they, they would literally ask me things like, do you have electricity in Holland? And I might say, when, you know, when there's lightning, and they go, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's 90% it's of American congressmen has no passport. This is unbelievable. So and they so have never been outside no. of the United States. And so I think you become a mu much more forgiving of American stupidity abroad, <laughs> when you realize that it's, it's actually born of the real cynical manipulation of ignorance mm. on the part of people. And I had my prejudices, so I, I expected all of them to have two jobs. I expected all of them to carry guns uh, and that sort of thing. And, and, uh, and so I met my first Republicans, you know, who explained yeah. to me why gun, gun ownership actually makes a lot of sense in a place like Kansas, which is so deserted that even if you call the police, it takes them 45 minutes to come over. So it, it makes sense to own a gun. Uh, and yeah, so it was, it was a really good experience. Uh, what, what did you study there? What was the I, Well, it wouldn't count, so I, I just acting and film and fiction writing, and it was just basically a year off. And those were the days when you, know, you could still stay eight years to go to university and just I sort know. of like I shop did, around. I did uh, six years of art school and then five years of the university sort of overlapping, but nevertheless, yeah. so I, I could go to Boston. I apologize <laughs> to the next generation who has to pay yeah. the price for this. Yeah. yeah. Um, then you came back and you start, decided to study political science, history, anthropology in Amsterdam, I think, right? Um, what made you decide for those topics? Or just wandering around in the different faculties because you could, or was there a very specific interest that you had? No, and I think it's, it's interesting because you asked me earlier, would you have advice for people your age? And um, you're always in interviews encouraged to turn your life into this beautiful diamond, you know, where, where everything led up to where you are right now. And I can feed you a story like that. You know, I always dreamed of the desert. Blah, blah, blah. That's crap, at yeah. least in my case. What happens is you're, you're, just, you're just billiard ball. And you, when you're born, you're just, or maybe a pinball. You know, your, your birth is, Pinch. they release the handle, a fibra cast, and you go, <laughs> and then you die. And <laughs> that's your life. And if you think you're, you can plan it, you're not, you're, you're, uh, uh, enjoy the days as, as long as it lasts. And it, that's not how it goes. Uh, and so I, I just, basically I thought, okay, so I lie, maybe I want to live abroad. Yeah, I definitely want to live abroad in the future. I, political science, probably, because I'm interested in politics. And very soon I, I realized it was, it was a really a worthless, very mediocre field. So I, I switched to uh, history, which also turned out to be very boring. And then I, did, I thought, if I'm going to be a journalist or a writer, I need to have this little 
special specialism that nobody else has, or very few others have. Because you, uh, it was the best advice I ever got. They said, you know, you, you come to a newsroom or a news organization, and all they will ask is, okay, what can you add? And enthusiasm is not enough. You have to have something specific that only you or a very limited number of people can do. And so I thought a language is easiest. Also, I went to the gymnasium here, so languages are not difficult. So I, I, I really, it could have been Russian. Yeah. I, I went to a shop and I uh, looked at the books. And so Russian words are very long. And Arabic words are very short. And I knew so little about languages acquisition. This that is I sort of like the Kansas decision, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so I thought a long word takes, you know, more letters takes up more space in your brain. It's, <laughs> of course, it's, it makes, it's, it's the absolute opposite is true because a long letter gives you more opportunity to catch what the word is. You know, like, I have not given it to him is one word in the Egyptian dialect. <laughs> and so this, I have not given it to her is of course almost the same. So this is why Arabic is one of the most difficult languages in the world. Uh, and so, but I, I still opted for so Arabic. So what did you, you chose the language first or you chose anthropology first? Or how did they Yeah, work? so I, I thought I did political science and I thought, okay, I need to do something relevant about an area that is relevant, uh, which is not Europe and not America. So I thought either Russians or Arabs because they're close. Um, and so I thought I'd, I'd do a political science thesis uh, on the, on how to abolish democracy, because the Russians had just embraced democracy, were, were in the process of abolishing it again, and the Algerians had had an election uh, where the fundamentalists uh, were on the cusp of winning, and they, their promise was to abolish democracy. They said okay. democracy is okay. one man, one vote, one time. And, uh, and yeah, then it's finished. So you choose yeah. for them, and then... So okay, that yeah. seemed, you know, the, the chief vulnerability of democracy is can be abolished uh, through its own pro processes. And so I, I, I began to learn Arabic, Egyptian di dialect because they didn't teach Algerian dialect. Again, I wasn't aware of that Egyptian dialect and Algerian <laughs> dialect are about as close as Portuguese and Spanish. And then civil war broke out in Algeria. So then I realized, okay, I, but I can already speak a little bit of Egyptian Arabic, so why don't I go to Egypt? And it turned out to be an, uh, a defunct exchange program, uh, which was never used because uh, the Egyptians would always send students who would then immediately go on the ground and go to working cafeterias and snack bars. So they had, and no, no, no Dutch person wanted to go there because you had to know Arabic yeah. to, to study yeah. there. But I could do Arabic, so I went there, and that's how I ended up in Egypt. So it's, it is that pinball. Yeah. And I think yeah. the, the key is, I think, not to get, get fixated on your aim, on your goal that you set yourself, but to just go with the pinball. But really look around, because as you are shot through, sometimes there are options. Yeah. And then you have to, then you have to. And maybe them. choose some, you know, the, not the most logical routes. Sometimes that that helps, right? Yeah. You could have done Chinese or Russian or Arab, but at least not English. Yeah. Although I think even with English, they're they're, they're interesting. Uh, oh well. Aspect, but it, it would be harder. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. would be harder. And and just luck. I mean, a lot of people went sorry went to study uh, Spanish for Latin America because Latin America was a was a big story in the eighties, and then yeah. it's completely disappeared. Yeah, it, it was all the Arabs, the Asians. Uh, uh, yeah, so they wanted China. to be journalists, but there were no jobs yeah. for local correspondents yeah. anymore. When I was uh, working as a correspondent, and say there was a major terrorist attack, then I would get an email from my colleague in Buenos Aires saying, "Well, I'm just off for the weekend. <laughs> now, whatever happens in Argentina is irrelevant now that you are claiming yeah. the front page." And so it's, it's always, yeah, that's that's journalism. You 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 went uh, first on this exchange program. What exactly did you do? So you went to Egypt on your own, you spoke a little bit of Arab, probably yeah, not, sort of... Not a whole lot. I, I, I had seriously <laughs> overestimated my understanding of Egyptian when I arrived. That helps as well, right? Overestimating yourself and just... That is a very male it's, thing. It's the Pippi Langhouse yeah. thing, right? Yeah. I've never done it, so I think I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, uh, and even with book writing, I have already done it four times, and this time I think it will be less painful. Yeah. It, so what did you do? You, you went to an exchange program. You were supposed to, I guess, take some classes in university? Yeah, or? so there was a faculty there, uh, political science and economics, where they, they trained, so there's a, an American university there where they trained the, the, the elite elite, and this was the sort of national elite, the local elite. So I don't know if you know, Amr Moussa who was the head of the Arab League, and Boutros Boutros Ghali, who used to head the United Nations, they went there. And so, it, it, so they train up their local, so embassy, uh, yeah. diplomats, uh, the foreign policy community, that, those sort of people. Um, and yeah, I, I just went there uh, and uh, I started making friends and my proposal was, uh, can you teach me Arabic? Which is a really good way in because there are all these, even in the mid 90s, there were these yeah, inequalities. You know, I could go to Egypt anytime I wanted. They yeah. could never go to Holland. Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. just wealth, it's just your passport. And there is this inequality. And so when I would just, 
you know, the ask. You know, the Talib is student, but it's also the asking, he who asks. So the Taliban just means the people who ask. Um, and so I would be asking you, and, and so I would you know, be thrown into contact with people who had never exchanged a word with a Westerner, because they couldn't. They spoke zero English. And that was fascinating. That was absolutely fascinating. And I, I kind of steered away from the elite faculty, because they, they were mostly middle-class kids, and I was much more interested in the truly poor, uh, urban poor, because I, I realized that their lives are so far removed from mine. You know, they, they live off a dollar a day. I mean, the reason, I mean, it's, I'm asking not because I want to have the life of yours learning, but because... You don't. Well, I do. But, no, but um, uh, because, because in the last book you wrote, you, you actually referenced that period as well, because you, you learned something or understood something there that was completely different from what you thought it would be, like, you know that the, all these people are waiting to become Westerners, basically. Can, can yeah. you explain a little bit what, what, what was that experience? What was so different than what you expected? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's uh, when I grew up, and, and, and um, I'd, I'd be curious to know if, if this is similar to for you, is that there was this sense that um, humanity was a train, and so we were all heading in the same direction. And then the, the front carriage was the West. You know, we were ahead of everyone else, and then the first bench in that carriage were the Dutch. You know, we were, we were the laboratory, Kitsland. Yeah. Kitsland. we were a laboratory nation. We were leading the way with female rights, with gay rights, uh, gay uh, uh, euthanasia, soft drugs, the whole thing. Um, and so I was, I was always, I had been led to believe that other people in the rest of the world want to throw off the yoke of religion and they want to become like me. Uh, and then they're also poor. And so I, I went there and actually they pitied me. Because I wasn't a Muslim, I wasn't Arabic, uh, and I wasn't Egyptian. But at least I'd come to Egypt to learn. <laughs> and so that we were, rather than you know, me having to deal with their inferiority, we, we had two superiority complexes <laughs> clashing. And I think, looking back, that prefigured very much the, 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 the current standoff in, with integration and the multicultural societies, that there was a sense that these people are coming to Holland to become Dutch. And they weren't. Mm. Just like white farmers didn't go to Zimbabwe to become Zimbabweans, they went to Zimbabwe because they thought they could have a big farm. Uh, and, and so I think that that was just, it, it was so interesting is if you do a big project that, and you keep, you keep going back to it and thinking about it, it releases new insights over time. Even 20 years later, you suddenly think, actually, wasn't this really telling in that respect? And that was the case here, that I, I, yeah, I began to think that I ran into... Um, Pride and um, conservatism, and also the almost comprehensive lack of any liberal values. I, I didn't run into a single Egyptian at that university in a full year, and I met a lot of them because everyone wanted to introduce me to their friends who th considered females fully equal to men, and gays fully equal to uh, heterosexuals, and Muslims fully equal to non Muslims. And so, what makes me think that if I give these people a Dutch passport, that within a generation, they immediately start raising their children in a, in a liberal way. And these were issues that went entirely undiscussed in, in, in Holland in the 90s. And, and I think it was still the, the time where everybody assumed, like, after a generation, they yeah. will be like us, right? It will, just, uh, it will take a generation. And now yeah. if you look at the, the, the re re Erdogan's referendum in, uh, for, you know, to legitimize, basically to legitimize his coup, European Turks could have swung that referendum by voting all of them. If all of them had voted against it, the referendum would have sunk. Instead, they swung it for him. Except in Britain, majority of Turks voted against it. But in Europe, they either didn't show up, so they didn't bother to help their uh, family members in Turkey, or they actually voted with Erdogan. Mm. So, and the T Turks, Dutch Turks, are the most successful minority uh, from the Middle East. And so this idea that, that you know, cultural, not only integration, but really acceptance of, of these, uh, what I find, what I consider universal values, equality, um, is not at all a given. I yeah. think we're going to have to work really hard to convert people to that. And, and the atmosphere, of course, in the country is completely different. Let's just, you know, s bang, bang their heads and hard arm Yeah, yeah. The, 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 that experience at the time, um, I mean, first of all, you got asked to stay in the region, right? You became a correspondent for, for NOS and NSA and and uh, in the end, you actually wrote about it. Uh, who the man slaat zijn vrouw. Soms zijn vrouw. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. What was the main point of that book? More or less what you just yeah, uh, suggested. Ja, so, uh, who the man slaat soms zijn vrouw. So a good 
husband sometimes beats, beats his, his wife. wife yeah. That was that was uh, about my year as a student. And when I, was, I went back to all the material I'd gathered, I realized, okay, so apart from, I think, sexually molesting your children, beating your wife is the number one taboo, <laughs> at least in the way I was raised. Because it's sort of the last thing you do. And then here in Egypt, I run in to these fi uh, women students and they tell me, yeah, but I mean, if he never beats you, even when you deserve it. And I think, wow, you know, it's not just I'm men. I'm not moving there. That's men, <laughs> it's not just men oppressing women, it's women having internalized that yeah. oppression to the point that they're actually, because the son of my landlady uh, was hunt, uh, casting about for a wife and a girl turned him down because of his emancipated views. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought, okay, that would be a re really good title for debut because it's just so shocking. And then yeah, the feminist bookshop in Amsterdam refused to sell it, of course. Oh, so I was a, I was a victim of then. political correctness. Okay. Yeah, 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 so yeah. Like, I'm, I'm finally also a victim, yeah. The, the next book you wrote, which was based on your later work there, um, was more about how the media works, right? It's yeah. Annette Manson. And, and this, is, this is a room full of media students, and as said, as promised, we're going to open this up to you very soon. But um, what did you learn about your, from your time there about how media work and don't work? Well, the, the, the most important thing to take away, I think, is that, that journalists pretend that they, they do all sorts of things which are actually done for them. Um, and so by the time, as a, as a correspondent, but the same is true for a reporter in The Hague, by the time that person appears on your TV screen or uh, is, appears in your newspaper with an article, a lot of decisions have been taken for that person. So what to cover and what words to use and who are acceptable interviewees, so interlocutors, people you can interview, and who are not. And all of that is, is governed by what CNN, for example, says, uh, the access given to uh, the local authorities. You know, the, for example, the Israelis are now currently trying to get NRC out of the country. That kind of intimidation is, was very common for Arabic, Arabic journalists. Um, and then you have to work with images, for example, TV images, because it, but if there are no TV images of a certain event, then all you can do is talk about it. Now, what if there are TV images of one party's scandal, but not of the other party's scandal? Or you give one minute to the Israelis, one minute to the Palestinians. The Israeli says, it's almost like the Holocaust. Your audience understands because they're from the West. They, they know what the Holocaust is. The Palestinian says, it's almost like a colonial occupation. And your audience thinks, yeah, well, that, was, that wasn't that bad. I mean, we did lots of good things in Indonesia. So, it's, and you still give one minute to the, uh, oh, no, you give one minute to the Israeli who has done perfect media training, who knows exactly what words to use and how to craft this message in 45 seconds. And then you have the Palestinian spokesperson who just goes on, oh, it's, a, oh, it's a disgrace and it's a resolution 427, da, da, da. incomprehensible. And so there, there are all these constraints on journalists, even if they are perfect. So if yeah. they would speak even if every, they try and they if they sp if they'd speak yeah. all the languages necessary, they'd read all the books. Um, they had infinite time. There would still be all these constraints. And my point is that if we would share these, it'd be open to our audiences about those co constraints, then we would become much more credible, and we could explain why we always fail to predict or foresee all the major events. You know, everyone goes on. Ah, oh, nobody saw tr 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 Brexit and Trump going. Coming. The same is true for the Iranian Revolution, for the first Intifada, for the second Intifada, uh, for the Arab Spring. And the reason is that these societies are fundamentally unknowable because they are dictatorships, nobody dares to speak out. And I think it would be much better to be open about this. And, and for your own work as a journalist, was there anything you could do to sort of make sure that at least your own stories didn't fall for all those uh, different... I think a lot of them are inescapable. So okay. the, the There's actually if, nothing you could do to Oh yeah, there are lots of things you can do, and so it's, it's a gradual thing. Uh, but uh, for example, um, there was, in those days, there was a, a major media war going on between Israel, Israeli government and the Palestinian authorities uh, about uh, occupation and whether occupation was worse than terrorism. And um, so there was this kind of victim race. Who is the victim? Yeah. yeah. And so images play an enormous role. Now, terrorism produces fantastic images. They evoke very strong emotions. That's why it's being done. If there's no mm -hmm. camera, 9-11 without a camera... Pictures or it didn't happen. Right. Pictures or it didn't happen. Now, occupation kills far more people, but not in a way 
that is spectacular or visually representable. So with an occupation, look at an Israeli soldier going through a pass or something, checking a, a passport. Yeah. With terrorism, you see a burned out bus with a, a little children's shoe. And so what can you do? All you can do, I think, is, is acknowledge this and, and uh, consider it material to write about. But of course, television is very dominant. And on television, in those 45 seconds or three times 45 seconds in a crosstalk, on uh, the eight, eight o'clock news, that's very, very difficult. And yeah. I found that it would be easier if journalists were, were more willing to acknowledge the fact that they are only human and operate under these constraints. But a lot of journalists have this sort of idea that they're really machos, you know, or the war correspondent, oh, look at me, I'm so cool with my, yeah. with my flag jacket. Uh, so they, they, they considered me traitors. I thought I'd, I'd, I would liberate them from the need to, uh, over, uh, to overpromise, but they, they love overpromising. So they they, want keep, to, they, they keep doing the, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. it. Because it's building up to, to this situation where we are now, and, and there's other uh, worlds you researched and explored to get there, where, where we have the feeling that... I mean, this whole week is about uh, fake news and, and what's happening in this post-truth world, which is the scariest thing that you can imagine, post-truth, um, that there seems to be a real problem that the media, the trust in the media is gone, among the people that need to inform themselves because they're part of the democratic system, civil society. And, and it's coming from somewhere. It's not about bad journalism. It's just they've lost trust in journalism, even good journalism, right? It's much bigger than a, a just temporary thing. Um, before we, we open it up to the audience, uh, you went on to research other fields, electric cars, uh, and uh, the banking world. And that's a really, really big story that sort of is at the basis of a lot of you know, losing trust in systems. And what did you do? What did, you went to speak to a lot of people in the banking world. Yeah, so the, the Guardian invited me. Happily, another instance of this pinball. You know, I mean, I, I came back from the Middle East. I spent a few years here. I had no idea what to do, and then at some point I run into the editor of The Guardian, um, and he says, why don't you come work for us? And so that's, that's quite a lucky break for any journalist, is. right? I, was, I ran into the editor yeah. of The Where did you run into the editor well, of The was, Guardian? It was a conference hmm? uh, on uh, innovation in journalism, and I was, okay. I was uh, hosting it, uh, so I was a moderator. And so I, I had some time with him, and uh, being English, he was very polite, and so I asked him, what do you do? And being Dutch, I didn't realize that it was his politeness. So I just to he told him. He thought you really wanted to know. I told him. Um, and, but it turned out I was then back then investigating electric cars. He had an electric car. So we got talking. And I get, get to explain why I, was, I decided to cover the electric cars, not to cover the news, but to actually investigate if it was a good idea, electric yeah. cars. And then start at zero, where my readers are, who know nothing about electric cars. And then for a full year, every week, you know, yeah. focus on one element and by the end we could decide if it was a good idea and he said why don't you come do the same thing but now not on electric cars but about banks and so I went over to London and um, did they maybe ask you because they needed somebody from outside of London with no ties in the banking world I think or? so so no ties to the banking world and also no ties to Britain because Britain is so divided between working class and middle class people yeah. and so as I say you know in England if you open your mouth half the audience hates you and the other half thinks yeah. hey, he's with us yeah. And so there's no way, just the way you speak, and in Holland it's, it's more like regions. Yeah, uh, they, it, when class. I open my mouth, they immediately think like, oh, Tilburg, South, yeah. you know, yeah. same thing. Yeah, and so it's a decision on I your part whether you would uh, overcome that speech de defect. <laughs> <laughs> well, now. <laughs> but it's, 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 a, it's a, with, with working class, the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, some no, working know, class people, they adopt a middle class accent. They uh, have to, almost. Yeah, they have to, almost. And so the, the fact that I was foreign, and half of the bankers are foreign in London, and the other half wouldn't, wouldn't be caught in this terrible, are you middle class, am I middle class, did I go to a more uh, uh, superior yeah, school yeah, yeah. than you do, am I richer? And it's so tiresome. Um, and so, yeah, and I, I think it was just also did this... They try, I mean, if you speak to people there, do they try to find out? I mean, okay, oh, you're yeah. Dutch, but, you know... Oh, no, no, because uh, if you're Dutch... It doesn't it, care, you're no, not so part of their family anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Dutch friends, when I moved to London, said, you know, keep your accent. Yeah, yeah. Because if you keep your accent, they will not play all these awful games with you. <laughs> and they don't, they just don't take you seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Which, Which, if you don't, I know, maybe don't want and, to. And that's the reason why they tell you things they would otherwise not tell that's everybody, quite possible. right? Yeah. That's quite possible. And it's, yeah. 
No, no, the result of that research has been because how long have you been there now? Six years. And and you researched the book for four years, I think, or something. Yeah, a little less, but all, yeah. all in all, it was a sort of four-year project. Um, what did you find? Well, essentially, that this this media and Hollywood generated image of bankers as evil psychopaths is, I think, a, a way for people to um, avoid the realization that the real problem is not bad people, because they're actually not that bad, um, but it's really bad structures, really yeah. bad incentives, really bad. We have some really bad laws governing the banks. And so we should change these laws. We need political parties to propose these changes. Now, that's a long and hard process. If instead you just decide, well, they're all like Leonardo DiCaprio in, uh, in Wolf of Wall Street. You know, they're all coke snorting, whoring psychopaths who sell yeah. you shares in companies that don't exist. Then you're free. It's easier. Bad it's, people. Yeah. They and should put them in jail, but they don't. But they should. And so again, it's this, this how the, the images of a professional group play a role in reality where that professional group again operates. And I think one of the reasons we haven't been able to make the bank safe, and this is in our lifetime, is going to cost us very dearly, um, is that we have the wrong definition of the problem. We think it's bad people, and so the banks are very happy with this because then we leave the laws intact. So it's like, oh yeah, bad people. We're going to have a cultural awareness. I could make so much money if I went along with all these cultural awareness trainings in Nairobi. You know, they go to to a, 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 a wellness belt or they get garbage heap, and then they spend a day with a poor child, and they have a big cry in their hotel yeah, room, yeah, and they yeah. find their inner child, and they fly back to London, <laughs> and they're back in a deeply sick organization where only deeply sick people or those pretend. To, who pretend to be deeply sick can survive. And so that was an important lesson. The other lesson is just that if finance breaks down, society breaks down. So this is not like the Middle East. Oh, I wish there were peace in Israel and Palestine, but if there's not, I don't care because it doesn't mean anything for my life. This is really, if, if the financial sector truly collapses, that, that will be like the 30s, you know, then... Whew, Our society collapses as well. Bank, bankers were hoarding food, guns were preparing their children for evacuation to the countryside. And I mean, most people didn't even hear about this. But this is why we threw all that money at them. This is why we didn't send them to jail, because we felt that will destabilize the, the system even more. The system even more. But now we're stuck. Is it too big to fail? We have to sort of maintain yeah. something which is wrong, but yeah. we maintain and it. And this is why we had to bail out the banks, the Dutch, German, French banks who lent too much money to Greece, rather than just that Greece would just say, yeah, well, we don't have the money. Well, then the Dutch banks would have gone bust three years after Lehman. Uh, or rather than we let the... <laughs> Irish banks go bust, we forced the Irish government to take over all the debt. So also the euro, the reason the euro is, is, could very well crash is the fact that we couldn't let the banks that lend so much money in euros collapse. So we're, we're really looking at one of the, I think, the most important problems of our time and it hasn't been solved. But So as a journalist, you, you've researched this, you've made this observation, you, you could become a politician, right? Because if you really want to solve this, you have to tell the people that make the rules to change the rules. Or you feel like, this. my job is to just show it, and this is the book, and now go change the rules? Yeah, I get but do you feel responsible now that you know so much of this field that most of us, I think, know very little of, um, that to, to make changes? Well, the thing is that it's the same in, in Israel, where all the human rights activists wanted to become journalists. Because they said, you know, it's the only, it, it all starts with awareness in the media. And all yeah. the journalists wanted to become human rights activists because they felt it was useless what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that the, the thing with... The, I am already in politics because I'm trying to influence people. I'm trying to open their eyes to, that, to big problems that, are, that, are, that go unaddressed. So it's just a different kind of politics. And I think what, what a politician needs is to build coalitions for compromises that that don't make anyone so unhappy that they're going to walk out. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not about giving a good speech. That's just extra. And it's become very important in this TV age. But ultimately, what our politicians do is just all they bang hats together between groups in society or between countries or where they have to work out some way to keep the show on the road. Now, that is the absolute opposite of what a, what a writer does. Every word in my book is there because I want it. Yeah. Nobody has any say over my book. And this is why the books are what they are. Now, that is absolutely incompatible. Just with even just from a character point yeah. of view, it would my be incompatible. My temperament is yeah. not I'm I, I cannot deal with people who want to I can I hate cooperation, basically. <laughs> That's that is <laughs> it's it's be, totally be taboo in the Netherlands. It. <laughs> it's almost like saying, you know, it's a, uh, I have a a really bad contagious disease. If, if you tell <laughs> Dutch people, I hate cooperation. 
but I do. The, the main thing we want to talk about, and I'm going to talk about now, is your last book, which because the theme of this week is the fake media, the, the distrust, the problems that have developed between, you know, how we vote, how we think, how we inform ourselves, and what is true or post-truth, you know, what is emotion and what is fact. Um, could you tell us the main point of the book, and then we'll open it up to the audience to really question you on that? Because it's the biggest point you, you are making right now. It is, it's a small book, you can read it in an, an evening, but it does show that you change your mind about a lot of things in the yeah, last few years. I was thinking uh, is whether, because I think populism, what is called populism, which is I think a useless name, um, because it's really a way, a label to just ignore somebody. Ah, oh, that's populist. You know, in, in 20 years ago, we would say that's fascist. And the populists do the same thing. They say, are you elite? Are you politically correct? Yeah. Which is also a way to, to completely ignore uh, the substance of an argument. Uh, but I think that the core issue is that they've, they've lost faith and trust in establishment media and politicians. And they is... Those voters. The voters, They yeah. just... And I would go up to them and say, you know, go, but you do realize that, that Wilders and Trump and the Brexiteers, they have no plan. Zero. And most of them said, I know. But at least Wilders is not looking down on me. Yeah. And, uh, and then they said, you know, the EU is not working for me. I'm a dock worker in Rotterdam. And maybe, maybe explain, because you actually went to find people in yeah. the UK and the Netherlands that yeah. voted for Brexit. Yeah, which is not Brexit difficult. For, uh, exactly. Who did you find? I mean, who were there? It was just very, I just used my extended network initially and said, okay, so who knows PVV voters who want to talk to me? And I, I rapidly found out that there are two categories. So there's the professional PVV voter who is welcome here on the media park. Relatively few people want to come out on TV, radio and newspaper with their names as PVV voters because they know their family members will suffer and so on. And, and they, they perform to a certain script. And they confirm all the prejudices that I had of, uh, of PVV voters, you know, uh, crass and racist and, and, and you know, full, of full of bullshit. Um, and then there are the other 99% who will not go on TV, who, who, whose name I couldn't use. And they were, they were actually struggling and they were full of doubt and they, 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 they were often ashamed uh, so even of, of voting builders. And, but often also sometimes had really good reasons. And what were those reasons? What well, are good example, reasons to vote for Wilders? Well, you are a dock worker, a 45-year-old dock worker in Rotterdam, and you have um, done a lot of training, but now you've been flexibilized, because that's the rules now in the Netherlands, so you no longer have an employer. And you have to be paid 17 euros an hour, because we have a minimum wage in the Netherlands. Now, your colleagues from, uh, with uh, similar qualifications, more or less, from Poland, Bulgaria, Bulgaria, Romania, come over, and they can be paid 5 euros. One reason is they are paid five euros is because their diplomas are just not quite as good as yours. That means that Erwin is now in, under, in a dangerous place because his colleagues and in, you know, if you're a dock worker, he was, uh, he was working with uh, molding, so mm -hmm. high temperatures. He says, you know, I'm, I'm under so much more risk of becoming injured because of the Poles, the Bulgarians, because they, they simply haven't done all the training because otherwise they would also cost 17 euros. Yeah, mm -hmm. So... Suppose I get hurt. Now, I'm flexibilized. There's no longer an employer who takes care of me. Then he says, you know, the other day I, I was driving in my little car and I went too fast. And I got this fine. And something went wrong. I didn't pay it. Bang! Double. He says, that's quite a, con uh, quite a contrast with a number of politicians who seriously mess up and then go to work for the very companies that they helped. Another uh, single mother with a, a child who says, you know, it's, it, if you live on your, if you, she was um, on welfare because uh, she, she has a, a condition that makes it impossible for her to work. And so she says, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been on a waiting list for years for a, for a, a house. And um, every year I have to go to hospital for my condition. Her son has also has a condition. So in Holland it works that way. You pay the four, first 400 euros of your medical bills yourself. Yeah. She says that's 800. Now on my kind of income, that is fast. Now if I ask politicians, if I ask the council, why is there a waiting list? Why do I have to pay all that money? Why don't I get a house? They tell me there's no money because we had a financial crash and we have to cut down. 
And then she says, suddenly, there are refugees, and they're coming yeah. over, and there is money. Yeah. Now, if you take that money from, say, the top 10%, you say, you know, we, we're going to install a solidarity tax. Everybody who makes over 100,000 euros pays 2% extra taxes and will pay the uh, facilities for refugees. Now, we didn't do that. Yeah. And so these people are wondering, okay, so... They, they feel it's their money that's being taken well, away. Well, they, they feel, you know, it's, it, my leaders should fight my corner. Yeah. And so I think the, the credibility issue is there, but there's also just representation. They feel that... That there, there, is, there was no party that said, Let, actually, the EU isn't working, so we have to reform the EU to, to help people like Erwin, or we have to go out. The only party you could go to was a racist party, but then when that racist party was discussed, or was part of the debate, all everybody else wanted to talk about were their racist expressions, statements. So it's, it was... It's so really real issues, real fears, and... And no, at the same no time, trust in the media or in political parties anymore. And yeah, an erosion of trust, and then also a lot of fake news in their heads. So a lot of absolutely crazy, mad ideas about that in 20 years, 60 percent of the Dutch Dutch population would be Muslim. Uh, that, that you know every uh, every refugee gets a saw, gets a house with a sauna. You know oh, the, the craziest. I mean that's that's the Telegraph. You know it's it's, it's the poison as well. That, that really has, has such, I mean, they were, they were on the wrong side in World War II. And, and there's, it's such a sick newspaper, the Telegraph. And, and they're doing this. And this yeah. tsunami of refugees, that, that sort of language. It's, and it's, it's so damaging uh, because it it's becomes impossible to argue. So, uh, yeah, that made me very angry. Uh, on the other hand, it made me very relieved because I felt that so many of those PVV voters were, are actually constructive. I mean, they, they take the, the, the trouble to vote. Which is a great thing. They're still part of the democratic system. It is an expression of trust. And, the, the, and, and 20 years ago, there was all this stuff like, oh, more people should take an interest in Europe because it's quite important and more people should vote. Now, right now they do, except they vote for anti-EU parties. You never hear this thing about, oh, mm. if people had more interest in the EU... I, or I think a lot of people would say, uh, we should less people, fewer yeah, people that, would that's vote. That's typically elite yeah. behavior. You know, we, we don't represent those views in society. And then when they come out in this distorted quasi-racist way, we say, ah, oh, that's quasi-racist. No, no, you're, no, you're no longer part of the debate. And that there should be a party for those who are opposed to immigration and the EU on non-racist, non-nationalist grounds. And then we separate the racists from the non-racists. There are actually quite, there are some people who work in refugee facilities who, who vote PVV. Because they feel that a country like the Netherlands right now just cannot absorb people, but now that they're here, we have to help them. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a much more nuanced and mixed bag these people and which i found encouraging ladies and gentlemen questions for yours remarks suggestions uh, ideas about fake news and how this worked in our democratic country and how we can keep it that way or change it who wants to go first no. oh frank no. wants to go first there you go frank and then students eh? yeah, that's really my, that's my role to always have a first question what was it again no, no. <laughs> no. Okay, make your questions short as well. Don't make them long. Make them short because we have 10 minutes left. So there you one, go. One, one of the points was, okay, there's post-truth, there's fake news, but how do you give a voice to groups that are not normally heard? So these voice now decided to vote PVV, but you, should, uh, you said, well, there should be another party that isn't racist that they could vote for. Yeah. Uh, but in effect journalism hasn't been able to give those people the voice they uh, have they have been deserving for the past 10 15 20 years or so at yeah. least not in the way i it think should that, have been. That, so what there are two reasons uh, one is the is, is social is that journalists are usually now from middle class highly educated and so they they are not naturally among the losers as that's called losers of globalization so they're very likely to come from families who've done really rather well you know own their own homes have seen the price of those homes go up they they're part of a different social class so there's a class issue um and i think the, the um and the other is that um if there is a party that is uh, opposed to the eu in its current form at least and opposed to immigration though it's it's a little silent on it which is the socialist socialist party now if you look at here in Hilversum, um, when the right came up, when senior citizens came up, they were given broadcasters. So Pau News and uh, Pound and, and BNL are for PVVers. And um, uh, 50 plus or max or whatever is for old people. But the Socialist Party never got its own broadcaster. They don't have their own newspaper. And so I, I, I spoke to quite a few PVV voters who were initially SP voters. 
And I said, you know, when the Socialist Party wins, it's just ignored. They go to the Labour Party and ask how they feel about having lost to the Socialist Party. And so I think there's, 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 there's clearly a failure here uh, in, in um, the public broadcaster. But it's also to do with the fact that if you look at NRC, but also NOS, there's, these people are so similar. They all dress similar. The Sun, which is an awful newspaper, but one of the reasons it is connected to the rest of England is that it hires people straight out of secondary school, straight out of high school. So they, they explicitly try to avoid becoming a newsroom with only highly educated people. And I think that's a really good thing. The only uneducated people at most newsrooms are cleaning the floor. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yes, yes. your question. Yeah. Who does young people uh, in England, you said, right? They only hire young people? No, no, I didn't say they're only hiring young people, but they explicitly hire people straight out of high school. So they, so because something happens, you will have noticed, you know, you've, You've gone to uh, an institution of higher education and you're socialized. This is the time you make your friends. This is the time you build your sense of yourself. And you do so surrounded by people who've made exactly the same choice. And so we have a very a homogenous media landscape, peopled by very homogenous people. And I think that we should, yeah, and it's not enough to find a few people with brown skin from middle classes. That is the current solution. More questions? Oh, we might. Yes, oh, girl in the middle. You? And we're going Mag to throw this over there, so be careful. Mag ik call you? There you go. <laughs> oh, it's between yeah. you and them yeah. now. There you go. <laughs> oh, much better. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, I was told that you gave away your prize money that you won for the NSP Bix Prize to follow the money. True. Um, and I was wondering. Do you think that investigative journalism can still influence the, the public discourse now, or, or is the public too wary of journalism in general? Well, um, I, would, I wouldn't overstate the collapsing credibility. So there, yes, there are the, um, quite millions of people voting for parties with no solution, but it doesn't mean that everyone has suddenly become entirely despondent or full of despair. Um, and so I think it definitely still has an impact, but for it to have an impact, you need to have a political system that responds. And I think one of the reasons that journalism is in such a bad place is that journalism is in a way is like letters to the leader. You're, you're telling the leader, this is going on in your society, or this could be a solution to that problem. The, but that, suggest, that implies that the leader is in charge. Now, what we've done under Europeanization, which I think ultimately I support, but we have done it um, sort of without thinking, is that we've, we've taken so many instruments of the leader away from him or her. So the court in Strasbourg or Luxembourg is now in charge of our legal system. Our monetary decisions are taken in Frankfurt. Our military decisions are taken at NATO. Our financial decisions, many of them, are taken in London. And so these letters are still to the leader, but the leader has become more like a manager. And so the question is, why would I then follow those letters if it, the guy isn't really in charge anyway? And besides, after he's no longer my leader, he goes to work for the banks. So the, this deep politicization that we've seen in the West, across the West, under the reforms that started with Reagan and Thatcher, I think have had a huge impact on, on just the relevance of journalism, which doesn't mean that there aren't all these opportunities. And I think something like Follow the Money is just, it's fantastic. The way they're now uh, going after this VVD crook is just great. And, uh, and it's, it's quite unusual because in newspapers, Almost everybody is, is being given this portfolio, transport, healthcare, but at uh, Follow the Money, you're, yeah, you're much more of a free agent. So it, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a fantastic opportunity to win the prize, and I gave the money away, but the fact that I said so in the television broadcast, that was truly useful. You know, Eric Smith, he said, you know, you could have kept the money, it's just the fact that you said so on television, because some of his reporters, then were called by their fathers. They, they, they didn't know I was going to give the money away because I didn't know if I would win. Um, and he said, you know, you, you have no idea what it's like if you work for a website and you constantly have to tell your father that yes, there's a future in journalism. Yes, I'm doing this. And then suddenly in his TV program, he hears. And so that was quite, you know, so there, there, there are threats and there are huge opportunities also with the web. There were more questions from the audience. Let's see, yeah, two rows back. Yes, there you go. Uh, hi. 
Um, you've mentioned that um, journalists are actually pretty from the middle or the high class. Uh, do you actually think that are also should be uh, attention or some journalism from the lower class? Well, I think well, in, in England you're, you're, you quickly learn to call them uh, working class and uh, not lower class. Uh, yeah, so let's call them working class. Uh, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's just that that's really essential. And it, it's, it's for the same reason that diversity in any setting is good. It's, uh, you know, I, I remember just the sense of embarrassment that I would be at the media park in uh, Oog op Morgen uh, and we'd be discussing an item about Islam and all of us were white and, so, and then there was the Muslim cleaner who was, you know, very delicately cleaning out the, 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 the rubbish bin and you think, what, what will he be thinking? Yes. And just the fact that you would have one Muslim sitting there and, and preferably I'd want a Muslim not to do any allochtonia stories but to do healthcare or transport or something. Um, and just to have that person there already puts a lid on all sorts of stupidity, all sorts of unthinking racism and the same with sexism. And so I think there's been a good focus on, um, on, on skin color and, and gender but very little on class and generally Dutch people are quite blind to class. More questions from the room. Take your chance, boys and girls. Now's the time. Yes, one over there, and then it goes to the front row. Yeah. Okay, hi. Uh, consumption, though, of the media. So let's say you're able to do some of these things you're talking about, getting it more diverse, representing the lower class. But if people are now able to choose what media they consume, and they choose media that just fits an ide ideology they already have, how do you bridge that gap and get them to get exposed to this more, more diverse uh, news that you want to produce. Yeah, um, I think th this is where um, there's a really divide, a real divide between America and Europe, uh, because if you if you don't have a public broadcaster, that is just really difficult. And I think I, I always think that working for newspapers is essentially that you are the unpaid research unit for TV, because the TV people have no clue. Generally, they don't have specialists. They just take their ideas from the newspapers. And so that feeds, that this, there's an infrastructure that feeds into TV and it gives ideas. And then if the broadcast is quite diverse, which is still the case in the, ne the Netherlands, I think that is still the best shot. Now, if people stop watching TV and even um, and it, yeah, l lose interest or, or faith in uh, public broadcasters, then ultimately it's going, it is going to be very, uh, very difficult. And if you, if you treat information like a product, like chocolate, and the idea with chocolate is that you have a free market for chocolate and yeah, if people, if 90% prefers that chocolate, then that's the best chocolate. And we cannot apply this to information, but we don't have an objective criteria by which to decide what information is better. So in a sense, the pu public opinion is a debate what public opinion should be about. It's in that sense very self-referential. And I think it's, it's just, um, I, I have no magic formula. I think America is in a very difficult place. Uh, I you, think think you, you think public broadcasters are actually on the side of uh, be, being able to solve some of that problem. I think they, 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 if they manage to maintain uh, plurality, yeah. that can be a really good channel into society. It's uh, a funny, funny thing, I don't know what I'm doing. This week, I, I actually consume quite a lot of news from my Facebook timeline with people throwing stuff at me. And there's lots of Americans throwing the Zembla uh, mission about the Trump-Russian ties at me. Yeah. Because apparently nobody over there actually did the TV research into all his Russian ties. And now Zembla is on a, onto a series, and so there's some yeah. investigative research from TV as well. It's not just from newspapers, but that's public yeah. TV. Yeah. But I think I think the, the fundamental issue of confirmation bias is that if people will just seek out information that, yeah, that, that help hardens course. their views, that is just very difficult. But that ties into I think a deeper problem is that just pluralism generally is that we 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 seem to have a harder and harder time to accept honest disagreement with others to say the we don't disagree on an aspect of climate science. No, you are just a politically correct tree hugger. And, and that makes any kind of debate impossible. And we've seen this with Swarte Piet in the Netherlands and a number of other issues that, that we find it increasingly difficult to just open that space. Um, in that sense, actually, the Telegraaf sometimes does a really good job. It does a really good job. I was very mean about them the other day, but they, they have, I think, been able to uh, maintain pluralism within sort of working class right wing that no, everybody else has just deserted. So there, there is no real broadcaster of the Telegraaf kind. So, uh, yeah. They're, they're still being read. C can we have it right? Yes, over here. Oh! Uh, you it can, can survive. You can just get don't seriously yes. hurt with this. Yes. Go ahead. It works. It works. I'm, sh I'm sure. Hopefully, my uh, phrasing of the question is better than the catching. Um, 
you mentioned in uh, Time of Mensa that, that it's super difficult to objectively create truthful news due to access, like you mentioned, or your, your background, the way you form it, formulate sentences, you choose certain words. Um, what do you think of the role of truth and is that the objective of news is in journalism? Um, well, I think to, to, so. The, uh, it, it helps to say verifiable truth. So there, there are verifiable facts and that should be the, the minimum standard uh, is to produce the facts you produce must be verified or you must explain why you weren't able to verify them because a lot of, a lot of facts are really important but unverifiable. So when the Dutch joined the war in Afghanistan, the occupation in Afghanistan, the best way forward would have been we have no way of knowing how our soldiers will be received because there are no reliable opinion polls in Afghanistan. Um, instead, we then sort of prefer to just leave that aside and not mention at all that we have no idea and just use some stock images from happy uh, Afghans when we arrive and happy Afghans when we leave because it turns <laughs> out it was all a failure or mostly a failure. Uh, so I think that there's, there's the verifiable bit. The difficulty is that, at least in democracies, and this theory, of course, predates Trump, um, democracies are built around separations of power and uh, accountability and transparency. And so verifiable information should be the demand. Uh, it, I think, for example, quoting people anonymously should be done only under very select circumstances. Now, in a country like Afghanistan or in a dictatorship like Egypt, it's organized around intransparent intransparent. So you, you cannot possibly know what people think. And when they think, they, their head is full of propaganda and brainwashing. And so I think to point this out is the only way forward then. To just say, look, if I would apply my standards of Western journalism here, I would end up with only verifiable information. So natural disasters, terrorist attacks and Arab League meetings. Because they are the only three that provide. But the real story, what it's like to be on a dictatorship, I can't talk about it because there are no opinion polls of people saying, oh no, a dictatorship. There's nobody revolting against a dictatorship because that gets you killed. And so you, I think you have to develop a whole new vocabulary and genres for uh, journalism about these non-Western or non-democratic uh, environments. And so truth has a role to, to play. It's, it just, it's, it's this thing that you can't do without, but if you limit journalism to just what you can verify, then you end up with, with also, then it becomes also very easy to manipulate you. Because the dictator will simply ban you from access to that, to that place and you can't verify. And that's what corporations do and that's what, what uh, the civil service does. They ban their employees from talking to journalists. And then if you can only quote people on the record with names, that means they can never quote anybody anymore. So you can never write about what's going on in these organizations. You always have to talk to the top people and their PR people. So it's, it's a very complicated, it's not really sort of bad guys, good guys. It's constantly feeling your way around all these constraints. And I think the web is fantastic because you can at least be open about the constraints on the web. You can do an extra piece, explain. Uh, we did a, there was a whole book about 20 correspondents who did a book about all the things I cannot talk about. And it was fantastic stories. It turned out to be a really good peg to ask a journalist, so what's the story you can't do and why? And say, well, in Russia, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. So creative, creativity. Can I throw one more? I think we actually have to stop. Yes, one right one over there. I give you the, oh, the most a, difficult one. This guy over there. Uh, oh, almost, almost. Ah, thank you. This is going to be the last question, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, go ahead. For me, as a kid, uh, NOS was uh, was the most trustful uh, news uh, spreader for me, and uh, now I see on uh, Facebook and uh, social media that NOS is also. Uh, Making funny, uh, funny quotes for getting likes and uh, and uh, yeah for spreading the news. Do you think uh, NOS is still an independent uh, news uh, organization? <laughs> well, the, the thing is that they've they've been brought under the same regime as everything else, which is uh, ratings, so cakes And so we we have made the democratic decision to to force journalists at the public broadcasters to do everything they can to get enough ratings. And that means that yeah we're getting the media we deserve in that sense. And so I think there's a, a very twisted attitude on the part of the audience. On the one hand, they want to be taken seriously, but when you take them seriously, they zap away. And so I think that this is, and this is difficult because, because you could have the American model, like NPR and PBS, but that is just a tiny segment. And so the idea of, of the pub public broadcast is also that you try to 
reach millions in a kind of sandwich model. So you also sneak in a lot of serious information amid all the funny movies and the memes and the... And so I, I can see the argument behind it, but it's a very, it's a slippery slope. And I find that NOS Channel, also Radio 1 on, uh, that I used to work for, has, I feel, seriously dumbed down. And what it means is that a lot of high quality people, high caliber people leave and their places are taken by people who simply are more superficial. I mean, there's also something like intelligence. And if the, the average intelligence of a newsroom goes down 20 points, that, that has an effect. So I, I think they're still independent, and, and I, I don't buy many, any of the conspiracy theories. Um, it's, it's usually mostly just um, unthinking actions rather than a conspiracy. Conspiracy is very optimistic. Huh? There is a group of people behind the scenes who control everything. That means at least there's control. And a plan. Now, and a plan. The truly frightening thing is there's no plan. <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone is a pinball. And human beings struggle really hard in accepting that because that means you're very vulnerable. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>